Hello, Bye. everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to give it about 10 seconds until we are able to get all of our webinar participants um, joining. Thanks so much for taking the time uh, to be with us today. All right. Um, hello, namaste to everybody. Thank you for joining us across the many time zones. Um, my name is Pyle Sampat. I'm the Mining Program Director at Earthworks, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting communities and the environment from the adverse impacts of oil, gas, and mining. Um, right. We're so grateful to um, all of you who can be here today and to Niskmata, Nick and Rachel <coughs> for their time and their work. Um, I wanted to uh, start with a uh, short introduction about um, our work, followed by some framing remarks from uh, Niskmata and then the main um, presentation from Nick and Rachel. And then after that, we'll have <coughs> time for some questions from the audience. And um, I believe that you can share those with us using the chat function or the Q&A function in the webinar or in the uh, comments on Facebook. Thank you. Um, so Earthwork supports the transition to 100% renewable clean energy economy. Uh, but we must ensure that that low carbon transition does not replicate the mistakes of the dirty fossil fuel energy economy that we're trying to replace. In 2019, we launched an initiative called Making Clean Energy Clean, Just, and Equitable to advance our understanding of just how to do that. Um, and we commissioned the first installment of research from the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, their research found that to achieve a 1.5 degree warming scenario, uh, the trajectory of demand for lithium, nickel, cobalt, and other battery minerals in particular would require unimaginable increases in minerals production. Um, this was of great concern to us as it implied that the human and environmental costs of mineral extraction would be um, rising steeply as well, especially in places where these minerals are concentrated in the salt flats of Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile for lithium, the Democratic Republic of Congo for cobalt, um, and Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and elsewhere for nickel. So without the right safeguards in place, we endanger both the durability of this important transition, as well as the health and safety of communities and ecosystems. So here at Earthworks, we think that we, we find ourselves in an opportunity moment. It's an opportunity not only to transition to renewable energy, but also to transition to a sustainable materials economy, um, to make systemic shifts, not only in how we obtain minerals, but also how much we are consuming as a society and who has access to those benefits. So with those questions in mind, we commissioned a second tranche of research from the University of Technology, Sydney, which uh, Nick, and Nick and Rachel will soon be presenting. Uh, we wanted to answer the question of how we can make this transition without generating um, the harm that's caused by mining. How can we obtain the minerals for battery technologies without digging huge holes in the ground? Um, so you will be hearing in a few minutes from Nick and Rachel, but before that, we are really fortunate and honored to have uh, Nuskmata join us today for this webinar um, to hear her perspectives on the impacts of mining on uh, communities and water. Um, Nusmata is an indigenous rights and land title advocate for, from um, the Sikwakam and Newhawk indigenous peoples with a long history of advocating uh, for mining impacted indigenous communities. Over to you Nusmata. 
Great, thank you, Kyle. Uh, really great to be here today and really exciting to um, hear about all of this work that's happening uh, around this clean transition. Um, as uh, Pilot said, my name is Nus Kamada, and I am in what is known as modern day British Columbia. And um, a lot of the work that I've done around um, advocating for Indigenous communities really has to do with uh, protecting clean water, uh, protecting these long term impacts that mining has on our territories. In 2014, we had the Mount Pauli mine disaster happen in my uh, territory here um, in central, what is now known as central British Columbia. And of course, this was a, a major disaster uh, with ongoing impacts. And these impacts are now the inheritance of our bloodline. These are impacts to water, impacts to our food systems, impacts to our livelihoods, and the way that we connect uh, in, in these areas. Um, there's also the local communities who have a lot of concerns around what's been going on. And so there's a lot of complexity when considering a new mine. And one of those things to consider is like consent, free prior informed consent, and um, the rights of Indigenous peoples as laid out in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous peoples. So that really sets the stage for uh, uh, decolonized thinking around mines um, in Canada and in many other parts of the world that were colonized. Uh, the, the search for gold and other precious uh, minerals and metals uh, has really put Indigenous peoples at the forefront of these impacts and these long-term impacts. Um, this legacy of colonization needs to be interrupted, it needs to be corrected, and that I think with this work uh, moving towards a cleaner economy that takes into consideration that Indigenous peoples, we do have human rights, that we do have our own economies that are based on the land as we are still connected to the lands that we originate from. Uh, we, our economies include uh, you know, locally sourced food sources. Where I'm from, salmon is a really big uh, food source. I know in other places they have their own uh, food sources that are being impacted by mining. Wild rice, um, you know, there's there's a lot of wildlife, there's a lot of medicine plants and, and foods that are harvested still from the land. And so when you have uh, polluted land, it's going to pollute uh, these sources as well. So we really need to shift our thinking around um, new sources, new mines, and look to this recycling and look to these new systems that um, are a cleaner path forward. So I'm really looking forward to today as well, learning from, from everybody. And um, just to keep in mind that, uh, you know, these, these conversations are emerging, this research is out there, this isn't new, these conversations are really important for people to, to consider in a complex way. So uh, thanks for everybody for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Mata. Um, we're very grateful to you for your time here. Um, and with that, um, I will introduce with great pleasure, Nick Florin and Rachel Wakefield Ran, who are senior researchers at the University of Technology in Sydney, where it's 7 a.m. tomorrow um, at the Institute for Sustainable Futures who uh, along with Elsa Dominish have led this important research project. Um, thank you, Nick and Rachel, over to you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. And can I confirm that everyone can see my slides? Yes. Excellent. All right, well, thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our key findings um, from this recent study investigating uh, strategies to reduce demand for new mining for lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, I will be co-presenting with Rachel Wakefield Ran, another member of the research team, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Elsa Dominish, who was uh, a key researcher who is currently on maternity leave. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, valuable expertise and insight from the supply chain, the battery and the EV supply chain experts whom we interviewed and, and the peer reviewers. Um, so very briefly, um, I'm a research director based at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, along, along with Rachel. Uh, ISF, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Futures, is a transdisciplinary research institute um, 
with a mission to create change for sustainable futures. We partner with government and, and industry and community and, and, and work across a range of areas, including renewable energy, transitions, resource and product stewardship and circular economy, which are, the, which are the areas that's very much in focus for this study. In this presentation, I'm going to uh, commence by introducing the research scope and, and our approach and, uh, and then discuss uh, the scenarios that we developed for quantitative material flow modeling. And, and these were uh, used to estimate, to quantitatively estimate the impact of the recycling strategies. Um, but we also looked at other strategies to reduce demand. And I'm gonna hand over uh, at this point to Rachel who will elaborate on these strategies and discuss policies that are important for supporting the deployment of the strategies and, and, and provide some conclusions. So the, the overarching aim of this research project was to investigate the, the current status and also the future potential of strategies to reduce demand for new mining, uh, for lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. We focus specifically on four important battery metals, cobalt, lithium, nickel, and copper. And what we wanted to do with this study was to understand the potential to minimize primary demand for these metals. We were considering, or we investigated the potential to recover these metals from end of life lithium batteries, but also from other products, uh, including e-waste to provide, you know, secondary materials for new battery manufacturing. Uh, we uh, quantify the impact of recycling uh, and in terms of its potential to reduce uh, projected future demand. And we also evaluated the potential of other demand reduction strategies, such as uh, product life extension and reuse and an appraised policy effectiveness. This work very much builds uh, on, on previous work that ISF has uh, undertaken, uh, also commissioned by Earthworks, and, and specifically uh, work looking at the supply chain impacts of renewable energy technologies. So this was a broader study looking at the impacts of PV and, and wind, and also batteries for transport and, and, and stationary storage. And, and one of the key findings and conclusions from this study was the need to, to really focus on the EV and battery supply chains owing to um, the, the significant material intensity of these supply chains and, and the associated adverse impacts on supply chain. Uh, the, the report also highlighted a, a good opportunity to offset uh, the demand for new metals through recycling and other strategies. You know, so some of these impacts have, have already been mentioned by the previous speaker. Um, but for example, considering cobalt, there are severe health impacts from heavy metal contamination uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, there, there are dangerous working conditions and, and child labor. In the case of nickel, mining dust uh, is associated with respiratory illnesses and cancers, as well as um, damage to freshwater and marine ecosystems. So there are some very strong drivers to look at ways of uh, mitigating these ad adverse impacts. So our approach for this research involved desktop research as well as uh, stakeholder interviews. Um, this enabled us to develop some scenarios for the quantitative material flow modeling, um, which we used to evaluate the impact of recycling on the uh, potential to offset new demand uh, for, for primary materials for EV. And we also appraised other strategies, as I mentioned, uh, that can reduce demand and, and, and looked at uh, policy effectiveness. The table here lists the range of stakeholders um, whom, whom we engaged uh, and, 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 and who, uh, who informed this research. So in the next slides, I'm gonna present uh, some of the findings that informed the development of the scenarios for the quantitative modeling. Um, in order to predict future metal demand, um, we use the International Energy Agency's Global EV Outlook that was published last year. This uh, study um, 
developed two projections, a, a business as usual projection and a more ambitious projection um, referred to as the sustainable development scenario. And, and we aligned our project with the sustainable development scenario, um, which we think is actually more realistic. It aligns with the goals of the Paris Agreement, as well as uh, international policy and incentives uh, supporting the deployment of electric vehicles. Um, th this study considered um, uh, plug-in hybrid, uh, hybrid electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, um, passenger vehicles, buses, and and trucks, and and it you know estimates a total number of vehicles out to 2030, and and we use this to then estimate the projected material demand. We also uh, considered the current status of recycling and, and the future potential. So this slide here, the, the figure shows um, an overview of the key recycling processes and you can look to the report for more details on this and I won't dwell on it. Uh, the, the key observation is that the recycling of lithium ion batteries is a relatively mature technology. It has been developed, uh, largely focused on recycling lithium ion batteries from consumer electronics. Presently, there are a number of, of large scale uh, recycling operations uh, in process around the world, you know, processing uh, several thousands of tons of, of, of batteries. Um, these processes, however, uh, really target recovery of the high value metals. And, and, and that means targeting the recovery of cobalt and nickel. Uh, the, the overall material recovery um, is, is at about 60 to 70%. So what's clear is that there is a real opportunity to uh, evolve these processes and uh, target a much broader range of material recovery. So in, including lithium uh, and, and co cobalt and importantly at a quality suitable for uh, using in new manufacturing of batteries. So I'm now gonna present some results. This, this slide shows the estimated impact of recycling on reducing primary metal demand um, relative to the projections out to 2030 and 2040. Um, for all metals, we, we show the uh, potential reduction in 2030 and 2040. Uh, the increase that you can see um, from 2030 to 2040 is owing to there being a larger pool of uh, end of life batteries available uh, for material recovery. The colors on this slide uh, align with the, the source of the recycled content. So the blue uh, aligns with uh, material recovery from um, non EV battery sources, in, in, including um, electrical uh, uh, and electronic equipment. Um, the, the, the orange aligns with the recovery of um, materials assuming the current recycling technology performance. And then the red bands indicate the potential increase in this recovery from end of life lithium ion batteries, assuming advances in the recycling technology. So if we look first uh, in the case of cobalt and nickel um, for 2040, um, there, you know, our study estimates that there is a potential to offset um, primary demand in 2040 by 35%. And as you can see, um, these bars for 2040 are dominated by the, the orange band. And, and this indicates that significant um, recovery is possible, you know, with the current recycling technologies. And it's increased obviously with, with improvement. By contrast, uh, in the case of lithium, uh, in, in 2040. Uh, our study estimates that 25% uh, of demand can be offset uh, with recycling, but in contrast to cobalt and, and nickel, um, this recovery relies on the advancement of the recycling technologies. And, and this is because the current uh, recycling processes are not targeting the recovery of lithium. In, in the case of copper, where we predict the largest recovery up to 55%, um, much of this recovery assumes an improvement in the collection efficiency 
of other products, including e-waste, and so this is the blue band, as well as um, advances in the recycling technology to recover copper at a quality suitable for battery manufacturing. Now, zooming into cobalt, this slide presents the results uh, in, in, in a different way. Uh, what it shows is um, the projected demand uh, out from 2020 to 2040 um, with, with total metal demand tons per year on, on, the, on, the, on the vertical axis. And you can see the color band that expands out to 2040 to reach 35% um, of total demand. Um, what is, is startling uh, is the significant increase in demand for, for cobalt. Uh, the, the increase is of a factor of about 40. And, and while recycling is, is obviously very important to uh, achieve this demand, uh, estimating up to 35%, it's clear from this figure that you know, a range of other strategies to reduce demand uh, are also important. Um, in order to um, offset the need for new mining. And I'm now gonna hand over to Rachel, who is gonna elaborate more on these other non-recycling demand uh, reduction strategies. Great, thanks very much, Nick. And good morning, everybody, or good evening. Um, so while recycling is really vital, um, as Nick has just demonstrated, um, it always still carries a material and energy cost and other kind of issues um, that mean that we do, um, as Nick noted, need to focus on other demand reduction strategies. Um, so there are a number of ways that this can be done, which I'll briefly go through now. And it's just briefly um, worth mentioning that we haven't actually quantified these strategies for non-recycling applications. And the key reason for this is that there's currently insufficient data for most of them at this stage. So uh, I'm just going to talk through some of the opportunities and limitations that we identified in the literature that does exist uh, and also that came out during our stakeholder interviews. Um, and I also just um, want to briefly note that the strategies that we mentioned don't relate to any um, particular jurisdiction at the moment. So while we recognise that some jurisdictions are certainly ahead of others, uh, we thought it was really important to kind of get an overview of the the general situation um, and the types of strategies that were going to be important uh, for everybody. Uh, so the first one uh, that we looked at is extending battery lifetimes. So um, as many of you may know, current lifetimes are estimated at around 15 years. Uh, and some manufacturers are um, proposing that they may be able to develop a 20 year battery um, in the near future. Uh, however, there are a number of factors which kind of may uh, impede this or kind of uh, make it a more um, inconsistent strategy. And these include things like the ways that uh, battery lifetime is modulated by the use of the electric vehicles. So whether the electric vehicle um, is driven in a cool or warm climate, the charging practices employed, um, and also the distances are driven will really impact battery lifetimes. Um, and of course, the other key factor is that there are a number of reasons that people um, trade in or decommission their cars. And some research suggests that people do this at around 15 years. So there's a chance that cars will be being taken off the road prior to the battery um, reaching end of life. So the second key strategy um, that is going to be really important in this mix is uh, reuse. So reuse um, refers to the use of a battery once it's been taken out of the electric vehicle after its first life, and then it's put into a second life. And so there are a number of um, second life applications that are currently, I guess, underway or being proposed. Um, some key ones are stationary storage. So this can refer to um, grid scale energy applications, but also for use in things like rooftop solar. Um, they're being used in other types of vehicles that require less power. So these are things like uh, golf buggies, um, forklifts, and also ferries. And there is some speculation that it could be possible um, to put a refurbished electric vehicle battery back into an electric vehicle. But um, I know there's a bit of consternation around this and it is still quite uh, controversial. So uh, we'll see where that one goes. 
So um, our research really indicated that the most likely um, market is probably going to be in grid storage applications, and this will give a potential um, extension of the battery lifetime of around 12 years. Uh, but it is worth noting at this stage that a key limitation at this point is that as you know, different manufacturers are producing batteries. And at the moment, there, there's still a great difference between the battery designs, chemistries, um, and even sizes. And a lot of the time, th these aren't kind of labels or e labeled or easily detectable um, for um, those using it in second life applications. And so one way that uh, companies are starting to get around this at the moment is to set up direct relationships between manufacturers and, for example, energy companies. Um, but it is something that will kind of need to be addressed in policy in future. Um, so another key strategy we looked at is um, shifts away from private car ownership. Um, however, at this point, there aren't really any good examples of this taking significant amounts of private cars off the road. And the other really, really crucial strategy uh, is improved public and bike transit. So um, this strategy will can really, really help uh, reduce private car ownership, uh, but there's still currently a significant lack of policy that is actively promoting public and bike transit infrastructure in much of the world. Okay, next slide, thanks, Nick. Um, so now I'll just go through um, just a really high level overview of some of the key policy reform areas that we identified um, that will help create a more circular economy for lithium ion batteries. So this is covering um, both the recycling applications and also um, the other strategies that I've mentioned. Uh, so the first policy area is improving battery collection. Uh, so at the moment, there are really, really limited um, ways in which you can actually have batteries returned from the electric vehicle at end of life and have it returned for either second use um, or recycling. So a number of strategies, um, we identified things such as uh, improved stakeholder communication, traceability of batteries is going to be really essential, um, and also incentives for users to return electric vehicles um, through kind of established take back pathways. So another related strategy, uh, policy area is transport and logistics. So again, there's currently a lack of uh, safe and cost effective um, transport and handling kind of policy to help ensure um, that both second life and recycling um, options can be pursued. And importantly, the batteries for each of these different pathways uh, are differentiated. So um, I guess the policy areas that we really focused on here were things such as synchronization across jurisdictional requirements uh, for things such as uh, dangerous goods legislation, um, licensing and compliance processes. Uh, another really important one, which um, I mentioned just briefly before, is design and manufacturing. So as I noted, um, electric vehicle batteries are currently manufactured by multiple companies with divergent design practices and configurations. So that makes it really, really challenging for people receiving them for their at end of life. Um, however, another kind of really important thing that's complicating, would complicate this, is that standardization may also inhibit companies' ability to protect competitive advantage in the market. So this will be a really important consideration when developing policy. Uh, next slide, thanks, Nick. Right, so the next one is standards across the battery lifespan. So currently there's an absence of standards um, that relate to things such as battery performance and durability, handling of used batteries and the suitability for diff different second life applications. Um, and these, of course, um, in order to be kind of meaningful, would have to operate across jurisdictions uh, and the different industries that would be handling them. Um, and it is worth briefly noting that some standards are starting to emerge, but they're really um, still quite limited and don't often cover remanufacturing and, and refurbishment. And finally, um, definitions and frameworks uh, are really, really important. So there's still inconsistent regulatory definitions such as reuse, for terms such as reuse, waste, and same purpose. Um, and this really creates confusion um, along the supply chain. And um, this is starting to be redressed in some jurisdictional contexts, but um, there are still a lot of places where this really needs a lot of work. So next slide, thanks, Nick. All right, so I'll just conclude with some really um, high level conclusions and recommendations that came out of the report. Uh, so the first is that uh, it's really important to keep, continue to promote effective recycling. So as Nick has mentioned, our findings highlight the 
importance of maintaining and recovering um, the key medals that we looked at and developing strong policies to, to continue to support, support these activities. Um, reducing demand for new batteries. So as um, both uh, Nick's presentation and the strategies I've just noted highlight, a really broad range of strategies will be needed to ensure that uh, demand is reduced for the metals uh, used in electric vehicle batteries. And finally, of course, policy change is really needed to enable better battery refurbishment, reuse and recycling um, in the key areas that I've mentioned. So these include collection, transport design, standards and definitions. That's all, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh... Nick and Rachel, that was excellent. Um, and it gives us 30 minutes for our question and answer session. So that was really concise and um, really appreciate um, all the work you've done. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but this webinar is being recorded. So um, all, those, uh, all that data can be um, analyzed and looked at and reviewed at your leisure. Um, so uh, we've received many questions um, through the Q&A and we encourage you to continue to send them our way. Um, and I will start with a few questions um, for Nick and Rachel. Um, I think one bucket of questions that I'm seeing um, is around policies, uh, basically policy tools for boosting recycling and um, circular economy uh, of battery metals? Um, are there one or two that could shift the balance significantly? And then relatedly a question around jurisdictions that have already implemented policies um, that, uh, that accelerate this shift, particularly around battery design and manufacturing. Um, well, look, I, I, I could kick off if you like, Rachel, uh, and, and, and offer uh, a perspective on, on the first. I, I think in terms of uh, sort of shifting uh, things in the right direction in terms of the recycling, one of the, one of the key insights and, and, you know, and the status of the current recycling technology is the fact that it only really targets the, the high value cobalt and nickel and a lot of the other materials, um, if they're recovered or perhaps not recovered at a quality that is suitable for new battery recycling. So it's not really promoting this, you know, battery to battery um, uh, closed loop or circular economy for, for, for batteries, um, which is, you know, what we're aiming for. So I think some important, uh, you know, sort of guidance for in terms of policy and um, and regulations is about setting targets and standards, um, perhaps above and beyond the ones that we already see in, 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 in Europe um, that really push uh, uh, the ambition to recover um, a broader range of the materials, um, uh, you, know, you know, setting standards, for example, for recovering lithium. And, 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 and at the other side of uh, the coin is really growing demand and you know in, in other um, you know markets you know, requirements around recycled content um, uh, you know and uh, you know it, it is really important to kind of grow the demand and 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 pull um, you know the the materials through to the new battery products Rachel do, do you want to talk more about the other strategies yeah, um, so I mean, I guess there are a number of things that are, are taking place um, at the moment. And just again, again, noting that we kind of didn't do an in-depth analysis of any of the kind of specific jurisdictional jurisdictions um, in their entirety. But it is worth noting that um, I guess the, the batteries directive review um, in the EU um, and a number of uh, recent kind of revisions there have refocused on things such as um, getting the definitions right um, that inform standards um, to help, I guess, guide um, the, I guess, down the supply chain to the design practices. Uh, and I guess the other um, 
key thing is, I guess, yeah, setting those, as Nick mentioned, those targets for recovery rates. So um, I think all of those kind of levels, while not kind of directly addressing um, things such as design, the constraints that they are kind of putting on the market and on manufacturers um, will potentially filter down. Um, but there's also um, in the report, there's a, a detailed section on kind of the, the current EU um, and US kind of there's mini case studies there of the, the relative status of each of those places if you'd like to kind of look further into that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, just checking if Nuskmata is uh, still on and able to take a question. Um, not entirely sure. Uh, Nuskmata, thank you. Um, and the question is um, about the implications of this research on um, how much um, we might be able to reduce the need for new mining through recycling and circular um, solutions, um, what the implications are for your work on indigenous title and land rights. Yeah, I think that um, reducing the impact certainly would be uh, very, um, you know, appreciated. And this is this is this kind of work and this research is really important for informing communities that there are alternative options and that there is science backing this up because often when we're dealing with mines, um, it's it's always the go-to is like, what's the science? What's the science? So having this and um, having this emerging and having so much interest in this, I think is a really um, important piece of solutions and moving away from super high impact mines, uh, looking towards, um, you know, reducing impact or, uh, you know, if they're, for example, in my territory, we have a copper and gold mine uh, just up the road from us. Um, of, uh, reducing the extended life of these mines is also a consideration. So um, I think that there's a lot of work that uh, Indigenous peoples would be interested in being part of this and being part of these solutions and how it lines up with our economies as well, like of the land. Um, so I think it's very important and worthwhile. So I'm, I'm really excited at the work that's coming out of this. So it's great. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to introduce um, Benjamin Hitchcock, um, who is the coordinator of the Making Clean Energy Clean, Just and Equitable Initiative, um, and see if he would be willing to field a question as well um, regarding the, um, the EU battery regulations and your thoughts on the, those regulations in the context of these findings. Could they serve as model regulations for other countries like the US? Um, and Rachel and Nick, you're welcome to answer that as well. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Pyle. Uh, yeah, so I, I think it requires a little bit of context uh, perhaps, but the, the, the EU has, um, the EU is working on, on, a, on proposed battery regulations that were published uh, in December of last year. Um, it's a pretty, pretty comprehensive and pretty thorough uh, proposed set of regulations. The document's about 130 pages long and has a series of annexes to it. And it covers, it covers a lot of the policy gaps that Rachel um, highlighted in, in her presentation. Um, and I think it is a very progressive step forward. I think it's a very necessary set of policies. And I think it certainly could serve as a model for for other jurisdictions. Um, that being said, you know, uh, Earthworks and, and some some of our um, you know allied and, and friendly uh, you know NGO uh, NGO colleagues such as Transport and Environment, the uh, European Environmental Bureau, are are you know have been working on um, a set of recommendations and um, you know points that need to be uh, refined and reformed to make to make the policy even more progressive and more more comprehensive. Um, that you know, in terms of in terms of the, um, you know the question about what are the implications of this research for that policy process, um, you know, I think one of the things that it proves, I and mean, one of the things that this research brings, you know, is 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 the evidence that it is you know it's already technologically feasible to be recycling these metals at um, at you know incredibly high rates, right? So you know, very very high levels of recovery, above ninety percent, ninety five percent. Um, you know, are, are feasible for, for these metals. Um, and yet in, in the proposed regulations, you know, lithium, the rates at um, the mandatory minimums for, for lithium recovery are, are quite low. 
in comparison with what is what is technologically feasible. And the timeline is is over the next decade, you know, which which could be sped up significantly. Um, the timeline for implementing those those mandatory minimums. So um, I think there are real, you know, material consequences of this research for that policy process um, that we, you know, we hope to, we, you know, and we, and we hope this is a contribution in that um, in that regard. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rachel or Nick. Would you like to add to that, or should we go to the next question? There's the next question, I think. Yeah, okay. thanks. thanks. Um, there are a few questions um, that highlight the concerns, um, the environmental and health concerns from recycling itself. Um, and um, one I'm gonna highlight here is how would you respond to those who say that global metals recycling is very dangerous and dirty and therefore recycling isn't a good way to reduce new mining? Um, I'll just say from Earthworks perspective, um, we don't think that sacrifice zones or sacrifices of community health or um, environmental health are acceptable and therefore um, addressing those very important worker health and safety issues and recycling uh, plant location questions are just as important as the questions around um, ensuring that mining isn't causing um, harms to community and the environment. So um, with that, I'll turn it to, to Rachel and Nick. Um, again, perhaps, perhaps I can start. I mean, yes, yeah, certainly the some of the key recycling processes uh, involve pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical processing. These are high temperature processes um, in the case of, of pyro uh, and, and, and hydrometallurgical involves the use of um, you know, solvents. Um, and you know, there are certainly process risks associated and, and, you know, and hazards for workers involved. You know, there are other risks along um, the supply chain, um, but Largely, these risks are well known, and um, you know, and there are measures and, and and approaches for managing these risks. And so, as long as uh, those are in place, I mean, if you look at um, lithium-ion batteries when they're not appropriately managed, when the um, you know recovery chain is, is 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 not managed in in a responsible way, where you know if batteries are stockpiled um, in large quantities or or um, you know, not not handled appropriately, um, they are implicated in uh, you know sort of fire factory fires or you know if they end up in landfill landfill fires. So I, I think um, you know there does definitely needs to be a priority in making sure that the whole recovery chain, the, the reverse logistics and the recycling processes, um, you know, are, are following best practice in terms of managing the risks. But 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 these you know this is. Um, this is certainly achievable. And I think, you know, in contrast to uh, potentially adverse impacts associated with uh, primary supply, um, you know, definitely moving in, a, in the right direction if we're, um, you know, promoting um, supply from secondary sources versus, versus primary. Um, you know, certainly in terms of the, the carbon balance, for example, there are significant carbon savings associated with using the uh, re recycled materials. Uh, Rachel, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I just, um, I guess, add to that. So as Nick mentioned, the, the risks are, are really kind of, they're well known and characterised and um, they are best practice kind of um, solutions um, that, that can be implemented there. Um, so it's certainly solvable, but um, I guess the, the question then, um, of course, comes back to where, where the recycling is happening and whether that's kind of in a jurisdiction where there are appropriate protections for workers in place and appropriate oversight and enforcement. So that's going to be a really important choice for, um, for I guess, manufacturers, um, policymakers, uh, and others that are kind of considering this option. So thanks for the question. I think it's a really important point. Thank you both. Um, we have a lot of questions, um, so I want to try and work our way through them. Um, the next set of questions, there are a few questions related to incentives, basically how battery metal recycling will be incentivized and or required. Um, would there be, um, 
you know, is there any way to basically tilt the balance such that recycling is prioritized over um, the subsidies that are currently given to mining battery metals? Um, and the role of extended producer responsibility and technological development. So I would just consider sort of what are the incentives needed to scale up battery recycling and what barriers need to be removed. Um, I guess I can jump in here first, Nick. Um, so I guess a, a key thing at the at the moment, um, and like my kind of the piece of my key focus in this research was looking at the kind of non-recycling applications. So I might just say something quickly um, about that first, um, because there are um, a number of uh, ways that people have looked at how you incentivize the uptake of the second life application. So for example, um, encouraging energy storage um, play, um, companies um, to procure reused EV batteries rather than new batteries. Um, and at the moment there's a, um, a, more of a, a cost incentive because they're cheap, but as uh, more and more cheap batteries come onto the market, that may not be the case. So there will need to be significant incentives um, put directly in there. And the other key thing that needs to be addressed there um, are concerns about uh, liabilities. So I know a number of companies um, are concerned about taking on EV batteries or second life EV, EV batteries because they're not sure that they will perform um, to this to a consistent standard. Um, but in terms of um, uptake of recycling, um, Nick, did you have anything um, directly to add about the incentives for that? Um, well, look, th there are a range of different ways to in incentivize it and different policy approaches and regulatory um, approaches that are being um, pursued in, in Europe, for example, uh, you know, much more of a, a, a a, a regulated approach where uh, standards are set, uh, you know, mandatory minimum collection rates and, and, and recovery rates in other jurisdictions like Australia, um, it, it's much more uh, an industry-led um, voluntary approach. And, and I think, um, you know, there needs to be the, the, the right balance in, in terms of ensuring that um, the recycling industries and the investment in the collection uh, pathways and infrastructure um, happens at pace with the arrival of the, the waste volume. So much of the policy is, you know, in terms of incentivizing recycling at the moment um, is, is very much focused on the recovery of batteries from consumer electronics and, you know, the, 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 the huge volumes from um, electric vehicles, are, you know, are yet to arrive. And um, they're going to be quite different collection pathways and collection channels and, uh, you know, to enable the recovery of, of, the, of those metals. And so I think, um, you know, there is a need for, you know, new policies and, and, and regs and the right levers to encourage that. But I'm quite optimistic in terms of the EV batteries. I think there's, there's more established collection pathways through auto dealerships that are going to ensure the, the, the take back of those um, Th those those batteries. So the collection challenge is, is perhaps less uh, difficult um, than uh, than in the case of consumer electronics. Um, uh, I might also just add, add, add a comment on EPR and extended producer responsibility, as that was specifically mentioned. And um, and 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 just to say that I think that you know it, it plays an incredibly important role in um, in, in supporting the establishment of um, Recycling industries, but also it could it could incentivize uh, and encourage uh, other strategies, other demand reduction strategies. It doesn't have to just focus uh, on on supporting recycling. Uh, I think the key finding from our research is that these range of strategies need to be pursued in in tandem, and and producers, importers, and and retailers um, are in the position to you know change the market and 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 create the right incentives to encourage reuse and encourage longer life as well as increase the uptake of uh, recycling and, and also importantly they're in a position to um, you know through different mechanisms such as levies at the point of sale um, cover the costs associated with setting up those management systems so I think EPR is, is critically important and, and it need not just focus on recycling it can also incentivize the other strategies. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, 
we have questions that are specific to different sort of ecosystems and geographies at risk, a question around um, the pressure to mine the deep seabed uh, for cobalt, nickel, copper, and manganese, asserting that the world needs to mine the deep sea for these metals to build batteries for EVs. Um, and then others about um, you know, different geographies that are at risk from uh, battery minerals um, extraction. And so the question is sort of, do, do we think that um, demand can be met through circular economy solutions and reducing demand or um, are the assertions that there really isn't enough uh, supply to, um, to meet projected demand um, accurate? So how would you sort of address, address those questions? I'm happy to jump in again first quickly. Um, look, I, I think that there isn't a strong driver to justify, um, you know, recovery from un unconventional sources like deep sea uh, mining when we're still, you know, sort of not, um, you know, achieving what we could be achieving with with recycling and and, and other strategies. Um, you know, the projections uh, that we use based on the International Energy Agency's EV outlook, you know, shows this, you know, huge uptick in in demand, and you know, it, it is likely that some of this demand is, is gonna to have to be um, supplied um, from, you know, sort of primary sources and, and, and you know, but, but, but those sources, you know, should prioritize the responsible um, um, supply um, and, you know, and it should also prioritize, um, you know, strategies like we should also be prioritizing, you know, uh, enhancing recycling, enhancing long life and reuse and other pathways before we look at um, unconventional and potentially really high risk um, sources. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd just um, add to that kind of, as we know, a lot of the kind of non-recycling demand reduction strategies really haven't been trialed particularly enthusiastically um, in many places. And um, there are some kind of really basic um, policy drivers that could do things like improve um, public transit um, options in different cities and kind of really looking at those those strategies to actually get more more private cars off the road trying them um, more effectively it's certainly kind of hope um, would be done before trying these more high risk strategies um, and yeah I guess um, also the other the other types of demand reduction strategies really do need a kind of um, a significant quantification to get those kind of figures so you could you could directly compare. Thanks. Thanks. I would also um, invite Benjamin and Nusmata if you would like to take that question. Um, no pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's. Uh, if, if neither of you is responding, I can I can just step in and say that um, I think from the Earthworks making clean energy clean, just and equitable perspective, um, that has been our um, assertion uh, to date. Is you know we aren't really exploring um, these various mechanisms to reduce and um, and and shift our consumption of um, of some of these metals. The push has been to you know, sort of continue with our extract and dispose model. Um, and I think this research is really important in um, substantiating that. Um, and, you know, I think where uh, new mining um, is occurring, it's not occurring currently uh, in conformance with the highest environmental human rights and social standards, despite a lot of assertions from mining companies. And that's another place that, um, you know, the shifts need to happen is is in uh, more responsible um, mining where it is currently occurring and mining that is independently verified as complying with um, higher human rights and social requirements. Um, all right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and those, uh, I think I'll, there's a question around uh, the energy costs for recycling, the sort of the balance between um, battery um, reuse, second use extension of life versus recycling. 
um, and what are the, what's the the balance of um, how does that how does that play out? Extending life versus recycling. Um, I, I'm, I'm, did you want to kick off, Rachel, or I'm? I'm, I'm... Um, I guess um, the I mean Nick, you'll be able to speak to the recycling energy costs um, better than I can. But I mean, I guess um, in terms of the other the reuse and refurbishment options, um, it really depends um, on the particular pathway um, and the scale at which um, the the option is being pursued. Um, but for example, in terms of um, a number of the, uh, I guess the, the second life applications don't actually require um, even a significant degree of refurbishment before being put into that second life um, application. So I guess in that sense, um, the actual processing energy costs, um, aside from the, the transport, I, I suppose, to kind of get it between the different applications um, would be relatively low. Um, but Nick, yeah, I'll let you speak to the, um, the recycling. Yeah, well, look, I mean, perhaps broader than energy, but just framing this whole sort of, I guess, decision about, you know, which strategy to pursue is, you know, the circular economy principles. So the priority should always really be sort of avoiding um, where possible, so, you know, through product life extension, um, reuse, and, and, and then recycling. Um, I, I think in terms of the specific energy and, and where the recycling technology is heading, um, it's you know looking at not attempting to recover the you know the, the the metals down to sort of pure ingots to then be um, reprocessed and remanufacturing back into batteries, but rather sort of more uh, um, direct recoveries where a mixture of metals is recovered uh, in combination um, that can be input directly into uh, a new cathode uh, um, for you know for for the next. Um, cycle of, of batteries and, and those sorts of um, recycling options that involve less sort of unmixing um, uh, and then remixing for new batteries, it, you know, it, it, it is saving a lot of energy. And, and, and I think, um, you know, there, there's rooms to, there's, there's definitely room to sort of, to optimize that. And, you know, and there are other considerations in terms of the recovery chain and, and, and um, the collection model. So there's, there's, there's lots of efficiencies. Um, there, but I think if everything is powered on clean renewable energy, then you know in in the future the the equation changes <laughs> as well. So, um, yeah. um, Rachel, did you want to add to that? We have a sort of a related question around which might be in uh, in your wheelhouse in terms of um, some of the systems shifts. Um, the questions around. Uh, reducing private car ownership and reducing urban sprawl and some of these other, you know, big systems um, reductions in metals demand, whether it's from secondary or primary sources, um, and that the potential for those kinds of systems solutions to reduce our pressure for new mining. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the, it's a really kind of... Um, Tricky one. So we looked at kind of um, case studies across a few different contexts um, for things such as the capacity of car sharing schemes and kind of um, on demand car services um, and then kind of collective and public transport. Um, and as soon as you start kind of looking into those cases, you realize all of the kind of um, really specific contextual variables um, to do with the kind of layout and structure of cities. Um, and other key factors that kind of make it a really kind of um, challenging to, to actually kind of compare in a quantifiable way um, the, the kind of the direct reductions that, that such strategies um, could bring about. And in terms of things such as car sharing schemes, um, the projections, so one study looked at one that kind of a model that used um, around 20 people shared a single car versus a kind of more um, higher car kind of model. And the, the differences were, were quite extreme um, in terms of the, the predict predictions. And there are also a lot of uncertainties, uh, particularly regarding to um, how the, uh, the battery was used in the battery lifetime. 
Um, so I still think there's there's a lot of research that needs to be done on exactly kind of how effective um, these strategies could be. But I really, um, again, based on these kind of um, basic circular economy principles, um, there is really no doubt that a, a shift to more kind of collectivized and, and public transit options um, is going to be so crucial um, to this shift. Um, and even if you say compare um, a lot of European cities um, to a lot of kind of North American or, or even Australian in cities, the, the kind of use of public transport is just the most convenient option for people and having a car actually becomes a great inconvenience. And so I really don't think we can kind of shy away just from the kind of um, the, the stark kind of obviousness of those strategies as, as kind of a really um, positive and effective way forward. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Tunus Kamata, um, Benjamin, and to all of you who were able to join us here today. Um, this webinar was recorded and we apologize to those whose questions we couldn't get to. We've actually made note of them and we know how to reach you. So we'll be sure to be in touch. Um, so thank you for all the work that you're all doing um, in on mining and renewable energy and a more just and equitable future for all of us. Thank you.